Hey, I'm Ron Drodos from KeyboardImprov.com and welcome to our journey through the real book number 219, which is Keith Jarrett's great tune, Lucky Southern. It's the 219th tune in the real book and we're going through them all in order. Um, this whole series of jazz piano lessons is to get us to look at the tunes in a way that can help us to learn them and also develop our own style of playing that's informed by the history of the tunes and the culture that they were sort of produced in, the time era, and really just understanding jazz in a way that, um, that isn't always understood anymore. You know, it's not all about learning um, um, chord scales, you know, or whatever it is we're learning. All that stuff's important, but a lot of times it's not even the best starting point. So um, we're going to dive into this. We're going to start with the musical form, because when we're learning a tune, uh, it's important to just get a sense of the form, how it relates to other tunes we might know or how it might be a little different. And then we're going to look at the chord progression of this and just see um, what's going on with the chord progression. And again, relating it to something that we might already know so that we're um, sort of establishing a beachhead. Like, we, okay, I know a certain tune. How is this similar to it and how is it different? That's one way we can, use, uh, one way we can approach most jazz standards. So Keith Jarrett... Uh, in the early 70s, when he wrote this, was uh, still establishing himself as, as a um, sort of a jazz star. You know, he, he had um, played with Charles Lloyd, and he was, um, you know, this is a time when he was about, when he was doing the Cone concert um, and starting to uh, play these solo piano things. And, and he was really um, expanding past, uh, you know, straight ahead swing. <laughs> playing earlier on with Art Blakey. He, he eventually came back to it big time with the Standards Trio. But this time, this is when fusion was, was sort of reigning and was king. So you had Return to Forever, you had um, uh, Weather Report, you had Miles Davis doing uh, fusion type playing, and Keith was playing with him at some point. And uh, so there's a lot of influences we're gonna see. First of all, it's Latin, it's a bossa nova. So it's got straight eighth notes, which is similar to pop music of the time. I'm not saying this is pop, but it's got, it, it's got an appeal that's sort of going towards that audience too. Remember, in the early 70s, swing eighth notes weren't the, the hippest thing, weren't considered like cutting edge anymore. It was a little old fashioned in some ways. And so um, people like Chick Corea, Herbie Hancock, Joe Zimonall, Keith Jarrett were playing a lot of things with straight eighth notes. And one of the reasons was because they liked the music. And another one was to sort of uh, connect with the public that was listening to classic rock and um, Elton John and James Taylor. So you get a lot of folksy influences too. There's not too much of a difference between something that might uh, be triadic in harmony with straight eighth notes, like a light pop song from the 70s. Oh yeah, jazz harmonies to that. under the same umbrella of what a lot of these musicians were doing at this time. So that's the culture that sort of was producing Lucky Southern. And uh, we'll get to the intro in a little while, but if you, uh, you know, if you have a copy of the real book or you play the tune a couple times, you know, uh, take a look at it. And um, what's happening here? Well, after the introduction, it's 32 bars long. So the first thing we think of is, okay, well, a lot of the great um, jazz standards that originated in the American uh, great American songbook, popular songbook, were, were 32 bars. Like Somewhere Over the Rainbow, um, Stard uh, um, yeah, Stardust, um, Take the A-Train, which is uh, a swing tune, Duke Ellington, Billy Strayhorn composed it. And um, a lot of those are A-A-B-A. So let's see, is this A-A-B-A? Well, the first eight measures. the A section and then it repeats another eight bars and then a bridge right but then the last eight measures doesn't go back to where the tune began it didn't go back to like we might expect in a typical AABA song I got rhythm or something so what happens well it goes to another section we might call it C so we have AAB C, where C is an outgrowth of B. It kind of seamlessly goes into it. 
Can you think of another tune, really popular jazz standard in the real book under the letter A? That is A, A, B, C. Well, A, second A, same thing, autumn leaves, bridge, the last A section, extension of the bridge, could call it a C section. Same form as Lucky Southern. Did Keith Jarrett know how to play Autumn Leaves? Of course he knew Autumn Leaves. So maybe he modeled it on Autumn Leaves, or at least he knew that you could do that kind of a form, right? Um, let's look at another tune. Uh, take the A train. While the harmonies to this in the first eight measures, it starts on D major seven, which is the one chord. Then it goes to the two chord, E seventh. Dominant seventh. We'd expect a minor to be two, right? The two chord's usually minor, but it's a dominant seventh two chord. What if, what other tune does that? Well, Take the A Train does that, right? Billy Strayhorn's Take the A Train, Duke Ellington's theme song. So could we play these chords to take the A Train's melody? Let's say. It actually works. So what's happening here? Well, it's not exactly take the A train because it starts out with the one chord, like take the A train. Then it goes to the two, dominant seventh. But instead of A minor, uh, E minor, like take, take the A train, it goes to the four chord. A little different. And then a flat six, five, one. So the only difference is in measures of five and six of the melody. It's a little different. And the four chord's a little more pop, or, or maybe even, in this case, uh, it's got a major seventh chord, bossa novish, but uh, it definitely has pop overtones, at least to my ears. So he's going to pop, and then this flat six, five, one, that's like, you know, that, that's swing era. That's like, that. big band. So Jared's bringing in all these different influences within six, seven, eight measures. And then in the eighth measure, he goes to E major 7, sharp 11 on beat 2, so it's like a surprise. Boom. We'd expect maybe a dominant 7th, but you know, E flat 7, which is a tritone substitution from the 5 chord, A. But major 7, very unusual. Maybe someone like Ellington would have used it in the 40s, but, um, but definitely a surprise. So he has this 1 chord, the major 2 chord. Then the four, which is a surprise. Then the big band thing. And then a big, what's happening here? Big surprise, boom, like the rainbow just comes out or something. Boy, you know, I don't know what lucky Southern means, but that's like a lucky chord. It's like, whoa, something magical's happening. Um, there's a lot going on in those eight measures, but we can relate it to Take the A Train, which um, if you don't know it yet, check out Take the A Train. Most jazz musicians have at least heard it or have played it. So it's something that we know and we can see how this just sort of goes a little differently, right? So then that repeats. The bridge goes to F sharp minor seven, which is a little unusual for bridge, going to the three chord, minor three. This, this would have happened in the swing era or the Great American Songbook. Maybe someone like Jimmy Van Heusen or um, Gershwin or Cole Porter, you know, they went to the minor three chord, but they probably would have set it up with a two five into it. So at the end of the second A, and then they would have done two five, right? You know, uh, we will never, never meet again. Um, bumpy road ahead. What tune's that? Um, the, 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 the way you then had. Um, there were, um, da, 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 da. They can't take that away from me, does that? But it would set it up with a two, five, one somehow. Um, but uh, he doesn't do that. He just goes to the minor three, which again is something from the one chord to the minor three, and then the minor two. This chord progression would not be out of place in like a James Taylor tune from uh, the 70s, sort of folksy rock kind of thing. You know, Jarrett's not exactly there, but he was influenced by that. You know, he, you know, a Bob Dylan fan. He's got on the record saying he likes Bob Dylan, right? He listened to this stuff. 
he played the Beatles song here, there, and everywhere when he was with Charles Lloyd. So there was some sort of pop influence on Jarrett, definitely. You can hear it in the gospel stuff with the Cone concert too. Um, and then it gets back into uh, the last eight measures, which we're calling C, which starts on the four chord, minor four, sort of one over three, flat three diminished. This is a very common progression. This is all the things you are. He sort of, dis uh, all of me does something similar too. He um, kind of disguises it or, or makes it a little fresh by having these, uh, some of the chords come in on B4. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Even there on B4, and then again, this surprise on B2. So um, you can follow some of that, you know, watch it again, look at your lead sheet, play through it, come back and follow my train of thought there. It's how this tune relates to the musical form of, all the thing, of um, Autumn Leaves and the chord structure of tunes like um, Take the A Train, uh, They Can't Take That Away From Me, and uh, at the end, either All Things You Are or All Of Me. It's kind of a hybrid of a lot of different influences here in um, just a, really a, a charming tune, beautiful tune to play, one of the easier of the Keith Jarrett original compositions. So, um, hope that helped a little. The intro is just the D major chord that has this like um, uh, uh, independent line that goes from the fifth to the sharp five to the six back to the sharp five. Uh, very common of uh, bossa novas or you know uh, older Latin tunes like rumbas and begins. Cole Porter would have done this on begin the begin. You know. Very 40s, 30s, and 40s. When we the begin. Um, if it's in minor, it's kind of a James Bond theme. Sharp on six, sharp five, five. But here it's in major. So uh, again, another influence that goes way back to um, uh, what, 40 years before this was written in, in that Latin type music. Uh, so. Uh, you get the idea. This helps us understand how to approach a tune other than, oh, what are these notes, right? What, what does this mean? Related to things we already know. And then see how Jarrett brought in some fresh air to it, so to speak. So uh, in my version today, I'm going to start with the intro and then um, just go through the tune, take an improv, come back to the intro, and then um, end somehow. I'm not sure how I'm going to end yet. So hope you enjoy this.
fun tune. And I, uh, at the end, you can see I got kind of impressionist with those harmonies. Um, kind of Gil, Gil Evans, the arranger, was a big influence on me. I love his harmonies. He puts a lot of seconds in the middle, sort of these clusters with also open voicings. Uh, the composer Stravinsky did something similar. I love his music, Aaron Copeland. So it all, all comes together and we can bring what we want into our interpretations. Um, hope this um, uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, uh, made you want to learn this tune, whetted your appetite to learn this tune. It's really wonderful. It's not one that everybody learns, but it's a great introduction to Keith Jarrett's writing. Um, he stopped write, really writing tunes when he formed his standards trio or a little before then, but in the 70s, pretty prolific, uh, both a classical composer and in terms of tunes. So um, check that out too. Um, thanks for being here, supporting this whole series. Um, uh, I'm having a blast, so I really appreciate you watching, and good luck with your own music. Remember, at every step, enjoy the journey and let the music flow.